Good to see everybody here tonight. Take your Bibles, please, and open to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. You know we're doing a study in Zechariah. Is this your first time here for this study? That Zechariah is uh, next to the last book of the Old Testament. So if you go to Malachi and go back one book, you come to Zechariah. And tonight we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 down to verse 21. This is the second vision that Zechariah had. Look at verse 18. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? Pride is a sin that's on the top of God's hate list. Uh, Scripture is clear that God is faithful to judge it. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon was keenly aware of the danger of pride. After a sermon one Sunday, uh, he was met by a woman who said, Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, that was wonderful. And Spurgeon said, Yes, madam, the devil was telling me that just a few minutes ago as I came down from the pulpit. Spurgeon had it right. Genuine compliments are no sin, but he knew that puffing up God's people with pride is one of his favorite tactics. And if you're someone who struggles with pride, and I think all of us can say that at times we all have struggled with that, that we need to kill it, we need to mortify it. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God hates pride, and he opposes it. The word resist there is a military term. means to set against in battle, to set oneself against in battle. Can you imagine God setting himself against you in battle? Opposing everything that you do? Wow, that's scary. God hates pride. But what is pride? What is it? But let's first talk about what it's not. You know, first of all, it's not self esteem. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a, a good self esteem. And when I say good self esteem, I mean to value yourself because you are in Christ. I call that Christ esteem. I'm only somebody because Jesus loves me. And it's hard to not feel good about who you are because you're accepted in the beloved. You have been forgiven for your sins, and you are called the beloved by God. So I feel valuable because of my relationship to Christ. At the same time, I'm humbled that God would save a sinner like me. The grace of God exalts a person without inflating them, and it also humbles a person without humiliating, humiliating them. And pride is not rejoicing in the honor given. The Bible says we're to give honor to whom honors do. It's okay to say to someone, I'm proud of you. We're not, we don't mean that in a, in a vain way, but to encourage someone by saying, I'm proud of you. You know, Barnabas was an encourager in the Bible, right? That's why they called him Barnabas. You heard about the married couple that had been married for 60 years, and the wife was hard of hearing, and they were sitting on the porch one evening, and he felt a spark of affection, and he looked at her and said, I'm proud of you. And she said, what? He said, I'm, I'm proud of you. She said, I'm tired of you too. What is pride? Pride is an attitude of independence of God. Pride is uh, the agnostic William Ernest Henley who wrote in that poem, famous poem, Invictus, I am the master of my own fate. I am the captain of my own soul. That's the attitude and spirit of pride. It's the attitude of humanism that relegates God to a place of unimportance in our life. Someone said, pride is a telescope turned the wrong way. It magnifies self, and it makes the heavens small. Now, what does pride do? Oh, well, pride, uh, as we had said before, God hates it. It provokes deity. Again, it's at the top of God's hate list. The Bible says in Proverbs 16.5 that everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And it also proves depravity because notice it says, proud in heart. That's where it starts. Pride starts in the heart of man, in the heart of every person. It's something that we all deal with. Since the first sin in the garden, man, uh, uh, we came filled with selfness, selfishness, and pride. And then pride promotes dissension, Proverbs 13.10. Only by pride comes contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Pride is a reason for strife in relationships and in situations. It's the start of every argument, starts every war. And then pride produces dishonor, Proverbs 11, 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. And then another thing about pride is it precedes destruction. It precedes destruction. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
And so we have to learn this, that in the Christian life, we have to stay humble, right? The way up is the way down. Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone else around them uh, sick, except the one who has it, said one person. Now, with all that in mind, I want us to consider this subject of pride as we look into this vision that Zechariah has. I want us to see how this vision relates to the issue of pride, the sin of pride, and God's punishment for it. Now, if you've been with us on our study, you know that um, uh, Zechariah had eight visions all on one night. And the Bible makes that very clear in verse number, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse number 12, or excuse me, down in verse number uh, 7, uh, he saw these visions. And, uh, and so these visions here are given to us. Actually, it's in verse 14 and verse 15. That's what I'm looking for in Zechariah. Um, but basically, he had these visions, all eight visions on one day, all on one day. The Bible tells us it was on the 24th day of the 11th month that he had all of these visions uh, together. In verse 7, upon the 4th and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat. Now, in our calendar, that would be February 15, 519. Five months to the day when the people began to rebuild uh, the temple, the Lord reveals these eight visions all at once to Zechariah. Now, the whole purpose of these visions was to encourage the people of God. Uh, the whole theme of the book is really that God remembers his people and he will bless them in his chosen time. Remember I told you that you can, look, you can, see, the me, you can see the theme of Zechariah by putting together the meanings of the names that are in verse number 1 of chapter 1. Zechariah, that name means the Lord remembers. Berechiah, that name means the Lord blesses. Edo means at the appointed time. And you put that together, you get the theme of the whole book. The Lord remembers his people and will bless them at his appointed time. Now, the first vision that Zechariah had, he saw a man on a red horse, a rider on the red horse, which we found out was the angel of the Lord, which was the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. He was in a ravine in a valley right there by Jerusalem. Uh, we believe this to be the Valley of Kidron. And uh, he was among the myrtle trees, the Bible says. And most commentators agree that the myrtle trees were a symbol of God's people. So the idea is that God is among his people who are in the valley. Myrtle trees were kind of a humble-like plant. And he was there to encourage his people. His presence, his prayers, his promises are, all, are with the people of God. Now, in this second vision, it's divided up into two parts. Uh, first, we're going to see uh, four horns in verses 18 and verse 19. And then we're going to see four craftsmen in verse 20. And verse 21. Now, when Zechariah sees in the vision, it really, again, illustrates one message to Israel and to us that God is faithful to punish the pride of men. So I want you to look at this then and see, first of all, the first part of this vision, which I call the, the part of pride, which is the four horns. Look at verse 18. And then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. Now, in this second vision then, Zechariah simply sees four horns. Now, these are horns of an animal, and it doesn't really mention the specific type of animal. It could have been the horn of a wild ox, or it could have been the horn of a bull or a goat or, or some combination of these. It doesn't really matter the animal because really the focus is on the horn, not the animal. And people in the East, you know, it may be hard for us to see this, you know, why a vision of four horns? You know, we live in a city. We're not pastoral people in the sense that we live out in the country or rural areas. People of the East were always pastoral people with flocks and herds, and they knew that the strongest and most dominant animal in the herd were furnished with horns. Horns were a natural symbol of power and pride. Well, Kaiser, the great Old Testament scholar, says, horns, the pride and symbol of strength of the animals that sport them are, all, are used here figuratively to represent the nations that plagued Israel. So to lift up one's horn was a sign of pride. Uh, it was a sign of power. To lower one's horn is the idea of uh, a symbol of defeat. And so here the horn is just a metaphor that is, speaks about the pride of a nation or the pride of a king 
or his kingdom. That's the whole idea here. So we, see, so we have four horns lifted up in pride. Now, notice what Zechariah asked. Look at the rest of verse number 19. The rest of verse number 19. And I said to, unto the angel that talked with me, uh, what be these? Uh, that would be the, certainly uh, the question to ask. You know, what are these? You know, he sees this vision, but he doesn't really understand what it is. And so he asked the question, you know, what is this? What, what are these? Now, just as in the first vision, Zechariah needed divine illumination. He needed help to understand what God is, was speaking about in this vision. Now, remember, the, we said in the first vision, there was an interpreting angel that was with him through all of these visions. And this interpreting angel will tell Zechariah the meaning of these things that he sees. We were introduced to this angel. And here he answers Zechariah, look at the rest of verse 19, and he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So the angel answered by pointing out that the horns represented kings and their kingdoms which have come against the people of God, people of Judah, Israel, and God's city, Jerusalem. Now, specifically, the identifications of these kings and nations are really debated by commentators as you study this. Some commentators say that the four horns are, since these are, represent nations that oppress God's people, this has to be Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and the Medo-Persians, all past uh, and current oppressors of the people of Israel. So certainly the four horns represent those four nations. Others say that the same kings and nations that are given in the book of Daniel, certainly that's what Zechariah is referring to here. You remember that uh, in Daniel's vision, uh, he had of the statue, there were four nations represented, and also later the visions of the animals, but that was the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian, Greece, and Rome. So there are a group of commentators that hold that view, that the four horns actually represent these four empires and the kings who brought their kingdoms against Israel. For example, one Jewish rabbi who was a, uh, a man who believed the word of God, Rabbi Kimchi, was a believer, he interpreted them this way. He said, these are the four monarchs, and they are the Babylonian monarchy, the Persian, the Grecian, and, and so on, he says. And this is, again, a view that a lot of people have. Four horns represent those four empires that came against Israel. Now, other commentators say that the four horns represent the four points on a compass, north, south, east, and west. And so the idea is that Israel is surrounded by hostile enemies. There's no specific uh, nation or enemy that's in view here. These are just Israel's enemies in general, and they're all around them. They're all poised against Israel. That seems to be another common interpretation here as to who these four horns really represent. Now, either view is, uh, is possible um, on this, but the gen because the general idea is really the same. These are the enemies of God's people who lift up their horn in pride and power against them to oppress them and to crush them. And notice the last part of verse 9 these are they which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Where it scatters there to scatter like seed, they defeated and dispersed them, like Assyria who carried the northern, who uh, northern kingdom of Israel away in the captivity, like the Babylonians who came and they carried away the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity, um, and destroyed Jerusalem. And so, look down in verse 21 at the latter part of verse 21. So these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. The idea that no man did lift up his head means that these proud kings, when they came in and they, they came against the people of God, they punished Israel, but they did more than that. They humiliated them. They were overly cruel in their brutality. They did things they didn't have to do after they defeated Israel, so much so that God's people were so humbled and so humiliated and so beaten down and broken when, by the time they got done to them. Now, God did use these nations to punish his people, but these people, these kings, they were overzealous in their punishment, and it angered the Lord against them. In their pride, they were excessive in their cruelty. Now, unfortunately, we have seen this played out again and again 
throughout history, attacks against, first of all, God's people Israel. And, of course, we still see that today, don't we? But you look down through the history, you see that certainly. You remember what God said to Abram? I will bless those who bless you and curse those that curse you. And, and down through history, we have certainly seen Israel as being surrounded by fierce enemies, people that have wanted to stamp out uh, the, the, the Jewish race. In Psalm 129, it says, Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth now, may Israel say. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. This is one of the ways that we know that God still has a purpose for this nation of Israel because why are they still around? With all the enemies that have come against them, when you think about the Holocaust under Hitler and you think about the present Islamic terrorism that is constantly going on against Israel, you see this intense hatred against the Jews, this anti-Semitism that we see rising up all around us here in our own country. All of that. In fact, the entire Arab world is united in its desire to see the Jews expelled out of the promised land and even eradicated as a people. And millions of Muslims hate the United States. You know why they hate the U.S.? Simply because the United States supports Israel. And they hate the U.S. because of that one thing alone. But we can also apply this to the church. When uh, people rise up against the church, this principle applies here too. You know, when you come to a passage like this, what I've noticed is that commentators go to one or two directions. They either take all of this, spiritualize it, and apply it all to the church, or they apply it all to Israel, and then they forget the church. But the general principle is the same. Throughout history, there have been people that have risen up against the people of God, enemies against God's people, whether they be Israel or whether it be the church. Charles Spurgeon, in a sermon preached on this passage, applied it to both. He applied it to Israel and their future, but then he also applied it as well to the church. Horns are enemies that rise up against the church, against the people of God. And again, we have certainly seen that as well throughout church history. The church has been battered by storms of persecution from without. In the late 3rd and 4th century, the emperor Diocletian, a great enemy of Christianity, said that he was going to stamp out Christianity, burn all the Bibles, and he went on a campaign to do all that. When he felt like he had had all the Bibles burned and all the Christians killed, he erected a pillar over the pile of ashes that where Bibles were burned, and on it he wrote in Latin, extincto nomine Christorium, the name of Christ is extinguished or extinct. And then he extended his empire westward into Spain where he erected two more pillars that said basically the same thing, that Christianity is extinct, and he encouraged people to worship other gods, to forget Christ. But Diocletian did not extinguish the name of Christ. In fact, while he was erecting those pillars, Christianity was spreading and growing stronger than ever. And you know what? Diocletian died by suicide, as, as some believe, and his name is only remembered because he tried to stamp out Christianity. That's the only reason we're even talking about this guy because he was an enemy against the church, and that's the only reason he's remembered. There have been enemies that have risen up against the people of God all throughout history. One of the Roman emperors, a man was by the name of Julian the Apostate, and uh, he is said at one point to point a dagger to heaven and defied the Son of God, whom he commonly called the Galilean. And one time out in battle when he was wounded and he saw that it was all over. He reached into his armor, and he threw the, his blood into the air, and he said, you have conquered, old Galilee, and you have conquered. And you know what? He always will conquer. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the horns here then represent kings and nations and enemies that rise up against the people of God. But well, let's look at the second part of the vision. Not only pride, we see the four horns, but here's the second part of the vision, punishment, the four craftsmen. Look in verse number 20. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Interesting. Uh, Zacharias, continuing to look at the vision, sees four carpenters. And the carpenters, the Hebrew word here is koresh which may mean a worker in wood or stone or iron. That is why when you look at this verse in different translations, you get different words for carpenters. For example, the NIV translates this for craftsmen. 
And several versions translates it for blacksmiths. Um, one version translates it workers with hammers. But I, I kind of believe that's the idea here. It's blacksmiths are those who work skillfully with hammers. Um, I think that's the best understanding. You say, why? Well, because the same Hebrew word is used in Isaiah 54, 16. This is what Isaiah 54, 16 says. Behold, I have created the smith, that is the blacksmith, same Hebrew word, that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created that waster to destroy. And so the smith, or the man, who works with a hammer is what is in view here. And by the way, these kind of craftsmen, these kind of blacksmiths were respected in the society of Zechariah's day. And notice that there's four to match the number of horns, four blacksmiths for four horns. Just as there are four horns that rise up in power and pride, there are four workers with hammers or blacksmiths who can skillfully hammer down each of those horns. That's the idea here. It is hammering them down. Because notice what Zechariah asked. Look at verse number 21. Then said I, what come these to do? And so Zechariah didn't ask about their identity as he did with the four horns. He asked about their function. What are these coming to do? And the, and, the, and the verb do there is an active participle in Hebrew, which means they were in the process of doing. We could say it like this. What are these coming to do? What are they doing? And they were doing their work, which was, notice the answer of the angel in verse 21. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles. And so he says the blacksmiths with their hammers are come to fray them. The word fray here in the Hebrew is harad, which means to terrify or to make afraid. Cast out means to overthrow, to crush, or destroy. So the purpose of these craftsmen with hammers is to terrify the horns, to crush them, or we could say to hammer them down. For every horn that comes into existence, God has his craftsman who is capable of hammering them down. That's the idea there. God is faithful to punish those who rise up in pride. That's the point. Now, let's look at the application of this vision. How do we apply this vision to us? Because we see these four horns, a symbol of the pride of those who oppress and oppose God's people. And by the way, the application for Israel there immediately was God was going to punish the enemies in Zechariah's day that are oppressing God's people. As they're trying to build the temple, as they're trying to obey the Lord, they had many enemies. God said, don't worry, I will take care of those enemies. I will hammer them down. I will defeat your enemies. I have craftsmen that I raise up to humble and to terrify these enemies of God's people. But the question is, how does this apply to us? Let me give you just a few words of application here and we're done. God's people should expect hardship and opposition simply because they're part, they're his people and we're in an evil world. Uh, you know, whether it's the nation of Israel or the church, the Bible is clear that God's enemy will stir up opposition. I mean, the Christian life is pictured as a warfare, right? And so it's not a church picnic. I know we just had one. But that's not what the Christian life is all about. The Christian life is all about warfare. As the old saying goes, the Christian life is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And we are commanded to put on the full armor of God, right? That's to be our default mode. And in order to do this, we have to have this warfare mindset. You don't go into battle in a casual manner. You have to go in with your mind geared up for action, as Peter said. Far too many Christians are careless and casual in this world. And when trials hit or opposition comes, they're caught off guard and they don't handle it very well because they feel like, you know, this shouldn't happen to them. But we shouldn't be surprised that horns are rising up against the people of God because we live in this evil world. But here's another way we apply this. God will be the strong defender of his people and he will hammer the pride of the enemy in his time. 
God is able to humble the proud. He's able to hammer these powerful enemies. And again, we've seen this in history. Um, now, you might wonder, why does God permit this kind of opposition against his people? Why does God permit these things to come into the lives of his people? Well, for the people in Zechariah's day, God allowed him, them to have this opposition because of their own disobedience and worldliness and unfaithfulness. God uses this to correct his erring people. He will allow this kind of opposition and trials and suffering to get your attention, to get you back to being faithful the way you're supposed to be. And it teaches us to rely on God. It forces us to rely on God alone. You know, we're all uh, prone to not trusting God fully until we are forced to do so. And so God will allow this to happen. He will permit opposition to develop godly character in the lives of his people. Just like the hymn, How Firm a Foundation puts it, the flames will not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. But God will come to the defense of his people. God will deliver his people in his own time, and he will bless his people that put their trust in him. That's the message of this here. But then here's the third thing that we see in this, in this uh, vision. We must be careful to never get to the place where we think that I am something great in myself. Again, this whole thing is a warning against pride. You know, what did the Apostle Paul say? For by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's only by God's grace. God hates pride. He judges it severely. Remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible? You want a, you want a story of a, a horn being lifted up where God had to hammer him back down? That's found in the story of Nebuchadnezzar. We don't have to look at it tonight. We don't have time to go through that chapter, chapter 4 of the book of Daniel. It's a long story. It's one of the only chapters in the Bible that was written by a Gentile king. Nebuchadnezzar, really, this is a, a chronicle of his own testimony of what happened in his life. And you remember that he had a dream one night, and he didn't know the interpretation of it. He brought Daniel in and, and, and basically uh, told Daniel, you know, he saw a tree that was lifted up, and the, and, and the tree was so big that that every bird in the world could find lodging in it. It had such lush leaves, it could provide shade for every beast of the field. It had such great fruit that it could feed everyone in the world. But then in the vision, what happened? An angel came down from heaven with an ax and chopped down that tree and then put a, put a band around the stump. And this whole dream troubled Nebuchadnezzar, and he asked Daniel for the interpretation. And when Daniel realized what it was, the Bible says he was astonished for one hour. And then he said, let me tell you the answer, king. The tree is you. You're the tree. And, you know, you have this kingdom, and, you know, your kingdom is so great. It's, the, it's a world empire. And you are proud in believing that you're the one who did all of this. And so, King Nebuchadnezzar, what you need to do is you need to humble yourself. You need to, uh, you know, Give to the poor. You need to do all these works of contrition to show that you're humble before God. Repent of your pride. And you know what the Bible says? A year later, he's wa he walks out into his palace roof, and he, he just begins to look around and sees this huge kingdom, and he's lifted up with pride. And what does he say? Is not this the great Babylon that I have built? By my power and my majesty, for my majesty, by my might, my, 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 I, 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 I did all of this. And while he was right in the middle of that boast, an, a voice came from heaven and said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to, ye, to thee it is spoken. And the judgment that God pronounced upon Nebuchadnezzar came upon him. And you know in that story that he became insane. He lost his senses. Uh, he became like, a, like an animal so that he ate grass like an oxen. Talk about being humbled. God is able to hammer down those who walk in pride. Every person who has a position of authority and power needs to read that story and realize that if you hold any kind of power, authority, or if anything good has happened, it wasn't you that did it, it was God that did it, and you better give God the glory. You better recognize that it's, it's from the Lord. And the whole point of that story in Daniel 4 is the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he's the one who gives it to whomsoever he will. It's God who does all that. 
God is sovereign. He raises up kings and he puts them down. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. And that's the warning for all of us. We need to make sure that we keep ourselves humble before the Lord. And by the way, what is the greatest expression of dependence and humility for the people of God? What is the thing that we do that ex- expresses constantly our, our dependence upon God, our humility? You know what it is? It's prayer. And you know why we don't pray the way we should? You know why we don't have more people at a prayer meeting? Because people think they can do it on their own. They don't need the Lord. They may not say that outwardly, but the fact that they don't consider prayer to be something sacred, they don't pray a lot, they pray very little, and, you know, they're not praying and seeking the Lord and saying, I'm dependent upon you, God. They're not praying without ceasing the way the Bible says, and, and that's a pride issue. That's a pride issue. The greatest expression of our humility is going to God in prayer and being dependent upon God every day of our life. And so we need to learn from this vision. God hates pride, and he judges it. Napoleon was a proud man. He was driven by an ambition to conquer Europe. On the morning of the Battle of Waterloo, he got his generals together, and he said, we'll put the infantry here, we'll put the artillery here, we'll do this, that, and this. And he said, at the end of the day, he said, basically, Wellington will be the prisoner of Napoleon. And one of his commanders said, yes, sir, but... Let's not forget that man proposes and God disposes. And Napoleon, this little dictator, responded by saying, Sir, I want you to know that Napoleon proposes and Napoleon disposes. And Victor Hugo, the novelist, wrote, From that moment, Waterloo was lost. For God sent rain and hail so that the troops of Napoleon could not maneuver as he had planned. And on the night of the battle, it was Napoleon who was the prisoner of Wellington. God knows how to humble. And so let us be a people that is completely dependent upon our great God. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. Father, thank you, Lord, for the constant reminders we have in your word that tells us, Lord, that you are the one who's in charge. You're sovereign. And, Lord, we need to be dependent upon you. We need to be humble, humbly dependent upon you. And forgive us, Lord, for walking in pride. And may we be like the Apostle Paul and boast only in one thing and one thing alone, and that is boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, we have no other reason to boast or nothing to be proud about We are sinners saved by the grace of God, and we need to continue to walk in that grace humbly before you. And so, Lord, may we every day glory in the cross and what the cross has done for us and live humbly dependent upon you. And thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give us each day in our life. Lord, help us to apply this to our own hearts, and we pray in Jesus' name.